to respect those fundamental principles of international law. So let's begin with the basic issue, namely the issue of borders. What are the legitimate borders of the state of Israel? And what are the legitimate borders of a future state of Palestine? We're often told that this is a very controversial question. We're told that the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, the standard term in the United States is these are disputed territories. They are controversial to whom they belong. Well, not everybody agrees with that. So take the example of the former president of the United States, Jimmy Carter. He wrote a book a couple of years ago, and he said as follows, Israel's continued control and colonization of Palestinian land have been the primary obstacles to a comprehensive peace agreement. Peace will come to Israel and the Middle East only when the Israeli government is willing to comply with international law by accepting its legal borders. The main obstacle, Israel's refusal to accept its legal borders under international law. In fact, this problem, this basic problem, goes back a very long way. It probably goes back before when most people in this room were born. In fact, before you were even conceived in your mother's wombs. So, I can go back to 1970. One of the leading authorities in international law was a fellow named Quincy Wright. And this is what he says 40 years ago. He says, the major obstacle to progress seems to be the refusal of Israel to agree to withdraw from occupied territories. Exactly what Jimmy Carter wrote a few years ago was already written 40 years ago by one of the leading authorities in international law. The basic principle is pretty straightforward, and it's said to be a basic principle of the United Nations Charter. And the principle goes like this, that under international law in the contemporary world, it is impermissible, it is inadmissible, it is not allowed to acquire territory by war. That you cannot change the borders of your country by virtue of having been victorious in a war. That is not allowed in the contemporary world. Now, some of you might think, but haven't most states created their borders through war? And of course, the answer is yes. But it's also true that law evolves. That's why torture was permissible in the 19th century, and it's not permissible in the 20th and 21st century. That's why in the 19th century it was legally permissible for a husband to kill his wife. But times have changed in terms of the law. So to say most countries have acquired their, body, their, their borders by virtue of war, which is true, does not change the fact that in the contemporary world, it's illegal. So Israel has two kinds of argument. The first argument they make is, they say, but you have to remember, we conquered the West Bank 
and Gaza, and back then also the Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights. We conquered these territories in a defensive war, and that changes things. They say it wasn't a war of aggression, it was a defensive war. So, let me look at two aspects. First, the historical question. Was it a defensive war? And then the legal question, does that change anything? In fact, most of you are way too young to remember, but Israel conquered the West Bank in Gaza, alongside the other territories, during the June 1967 war. They claimed that Mr. Nasser, the president of Egypt, was going to attack and that they had to attack first to preempt, to prevent the attack by Egypt. And they claimed that Mr. Nasser, along with other Arab states, were going to destroy the state of Israel. Mr. Abba Eben, Israel's former foreign minister, he was the UN representative at the time, and he was the main spokesperson for Israel at the time. And he has a very dramatic chapter in one of his memoirs on the June 67 war, and the chapter is titled, To Live or To Die. That's what he claims the June 67 war was all about. The documentary record tells us something very different. Many U.S. intelligence agencies were checking to see what were the prospects of a war in Israel, between Israel and its Arab neighbors, because Israel was very careful they knew they needed American approval for the war because in 1956, when Israel attacked Egypt alongside the British and the French, it was the Americans who said, you have to leave. And the Israelis were fearful that the Americans again would say, you have to leave. So they wanted to get the green light from the Americans. So Israeli officials, one after another, were coming to Washington and telling the Americans, the president at the time, Lyndon Johnson, was saying, Egypt is going to attack. Egypt is going to attack. Egypt is going to destroy us. So the American intelligence agencies, a large number, about six, investigated they had very good contacts in Egypt, as you can imagine. Probably half the Egyptian government was on the American payroll. So they're investigating, they're investigating, and they, come to the, they came to two conclusions. Number one, they concluded that Egypt did not intend to attack. There was no evidence that Egypt was going to attack. And number two, they concluded that even if he did attack, which was highly unlikely, and even if he attacked with all the neighboring Arab countries, President Johnson, he looked at the Israeli representative and he said, according to all of our intelligence agencies, and now I'm quoting the president, he said, you will whip the hell out of them. There was no fear that Israel was going to live or die. In fact, the head of Israel's Mossad, he came to Washington in June of that year, and he said, and now I'm quoting him, there were no differences between the US and the Israelis on the military intelligence picture or its interpretation. That is to say, the Israelis agreed with the Americans. Number one, Egypt is not going to attack. 
And number two, 